Five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. The whole thing is very, Tate, very mysterious, Valley, but this is what I know. Authorities say a menacing letter received yesterday by a Vallejo newspaper was not sent by the infamous Zodiac Killer. That's again where it has details. That Area 51, the secret Air Force base in Nevada, actually exists. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. He's been called the East Side Rapist. He's been called the Visalia Ransacker. The original Night Stalker. And the Golden State Killer. You have now entered into the house of mystery. The best in true crime, conspiracy, and alternative history. With Al Warren and Kevin Thompson. KCAA, the stations that leave no listener behind. Broadcasting on 10.50 AM, 102.3 FM, and 106.5 FM. The trifecta of talk radio for Southern California. All right, welcome back to the House of Mystery on KKNW 1150 AM Seattle. I'm your host, Al Warren, and joining me today is Cab Thompson. Hey, Al, uh, what's going on? Well, I'm going to go buy some Nikes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what I hear. <clears throat> yeah. That's what I hear. Yeah, I am. Well, I've, you I know, just I've never... bought two pair myself. Yeah, there you go. See, there's Ron there. See, we're good. Hey, you know, but I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I certainly wouldn't burn my Nikes. You know how much they cost. <laughs> I know. Is that crazy? Oh yeah. Like, well, you can have you can have mine before I burn them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a waste! I tell you, it's a waste. Um, if you want to hear more about that, that you know, our show yesterday with uh, um, Joe talks about that a lot on the conspiracy angle, which is quite quite interesting about the outrage everybody feels. It's like every day. Look, everyone's looking for an outrage. Oh well, this one's easy. I mean, you know, a guy that sat on the bench gets in a major endorsement for not playing. <laughs> I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I, I'm glad Nike took the initiative. It's not often that I'm supporting of big companies, but uh, I'm I'm glad they actually did something Here. refreshing. You know, rather than just what they normally do, which is nothing. So, <laughs> well, the, well, well, they they did promote him from a quarterback to a fullback. <laughs> I want the full amount that I paid him back. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's <laughs> bad Republican jokes. And um, <laughs> okay, so everything's been going smooth. And um, what can I say? Um, it's smoky again here. We cannot breathe in Seattle. Um, more of the fires continue. And uh, I think it's the Republicans setting them. It, well, it's probably all the Nikes burning up there. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't do that here. It's a liber <laughs> liberal city. Not like Alabama. Come on. Um, okay. Now, t it's, uh, speaking of crime, and that, that means we're not going to talk about Trump, but we're going to talk about uh, <laughs> other. Remember, those yeah. were your words. <laughs> well. You know, I, it, uh, crime is crime. Hey, you know, I forgot also, I love the uh, hearings going on with the uh, uh, for the Supreme Court judge judge nomination. I Man, love, I, 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 all I, I can say is, wow. I, you what? know, but pro, to protest is to be American. And, and that's what it is to be an American. It's protest. It's the ability to, to um, speak your mind. Uh, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, will, I, I will agree. I will partially agree, but, it, but no, it's the ability to speak your mind. As long as you're not shooting someone or hurting someone like that, you can stand up and and uh, and uh, you, you know our our guests, are Ron Chepsick, and we've got Mike Rowe. So, hey guys, do you agree or not? <laughs> you you said a lot. To agree about uh, what? Uh, well, you're right to protest. Is all American? Yes, indeed, he is, and. Um, uh, I I, uh, I think it's very uh, very uh, ballsy of uh, Nike to do this uh, ad campaign. It's really surprising, you know, for an American company to stick their neck out like that. Yeah. But uh, I think they know what they're doing. Yeah. Oh, but sure. uh, we're, the guy we're going to talk about today, Teddy Rowe, was sort of the Colin Kaepernick of Chicago. Oh. <laughs> if you're exactly. Said, he wasn't very popular with a lot of white people. Oh, that's <laughs> right, Mike. <laughs> that's the way we like it. Well, you guys wrote this book. 
This is fascinating. Yeah. Now, it is on uh, Kindle. And right. It's called Robin Hood of the Hood. And it's the life and times of Teddy Rowe, Policy King. So tell me, first of all, before we get into the book details, how did you guys meet and get to write this book? Mike tells it well. Oh. I'll let Mike take the lead on this. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, sure thing. Okay, well, what happened was, you know, I had been a researcher in a long time, and I, um, you know, I had came across one of Ron's books. I had, you know, saw people referencing his book, you know, Black Gangsters of Chicago. And when I first saw the book, I was like, you know, what does this guy know? He's not from Chicago, a white guy. What do you know about, you know, Black Gangsters of Chicago? So I kind of, you know, I didn't bother about a book. But as I, you know, continued researching, I kept seeing people reference him. I said, well, you know, maybe I better check it out. So I got the book, you know, wasn't really expecting much. And when I got the book, you know, I couldn't put it down. I read it in all in one sitting, and that prompted me to buy several of his other titles, Gangsters of Harlem, the Frank Matthews stories, and a few others. And I finally just said, you know what? And I was just so impressed by the writing, the information that it contained. I mean, I thought that I knew a lot, but I found out so much more that I didn't know by reading his book. So I just... So I, had, you know, did research and, you know, got a contact number to his company, and I had just called him up one day. He was nice enough to take my call, and I said, first, I'd just like to thank you for writing these books, keeping these stories that I've still only told, keeping them alive, and, and I asked him for some research tips. And as we dialogued, you know, he said, well, why don't we write a book about Ted Rowe? We can collaborate, because I've been telling him about the research that I've been doing, about policy and numbers and stuff like that. So I was kind of like, yeah, sure. And, you know, I, and I didn't take it seriously because I was like, well, I've never written anything outside of college term papers. And I'm like, this guy's an accomplished writer. So he probably didn't really want to write anything with me. And he called me back about two weeks later and asked me how it was going. I'm like, wow, this guy's serious about, you know, <laughs> writing it. So I said, so I started, you know, getting my research together. And I was seeing what I did to him. And Ron was so patient and understanding that he knew I wasn't a writer. So he gave me a lot of tips about saying, you know, when you're writing like an academic, you know, let me tell you how to write about, you know, how to write for the general public. And so back and forth, I was sending what I had. He would send me what I had. He would critique, you know, give me, you know, advice about improving my writing. And about a year later, we had, we had the book. And I know it was funny. You know, when I first called him, I told him my name was Michael Rowe. He kind of thought I was a descendant of Ted Rowe, so I was like, you know, that was kind of like a, a, a funny thing between us. Now, I joke about that I am related to him, but, before, you know, I'm really not. But, you know, and I also said that the grand jury they investigated me for policy. No, I, I'm joking about that, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, I, I've hired uh, Mike uh, as my public publicity guy since then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's handling all my publicity. Of that. Well, there you go. That's good. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. 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 He, he said Mike Rowe. I mean, what are the odds of somebody interested in writing a book about Ted Rowe with the same name, you know? I was going to say. Uh, also, you got your own TV show, or you used to, uh, Dirty Jobs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was my former show, yeah, before I started writing. <laughs> well, there you go. A very, very busy person. Um, now, yeah, and Ron is a really, uh, um, how, I'm trying to get a good word here, but you're, you're a good writer, but there's a very, um, there's a certain word you can do. You're very detailed about your writing. You're very, um, into Meticulous. getting, yeah, and you want to get the right facts and everything. So, um, how long did it take you to put this together? Well, uh, it took us. It took us a little while. You know, it's a, it's a short book. It's a, it's an ebook. You know, we were t- trying to take advantage of the market. You know, for this type of books. You know, people have very short attention spans today. Oh yeah. And so, uh, if you look on Amazon, there's these uh, you know, what they call Kindle shorts. You know, the various times, like thirty to sixty pages. You know, that's thirty or sixty minutes or whatever. And so, uh, uh, but you know, Mike, like Mike said, he was inexperienced as a writer, and uh, I was curious to see what. You know what what uh, what he could do, uh, so uh, and we were in no rush, you know, to get it out because uh, it wasn't like a major project. You know, it wasn't it wasn't going to you know change e- uh, either of our careers or anything like that, and make us a lot of money and all that. So uh, it took us you know a little while to do that, and uh, we're sending back and forth. But uh, you know, it, it uh, the patience paid off because uh, Mike developed. And I saw him develop as a writer, and I used to be a writing instructor. I, I taught freelance journalism in U- UCLA's uh, Extension Division, and I taught a lot of freelance courses. So I enjoyed I enjoyed teaching, and it was I haven't done that for like maybe 10 years or so. 
so it was kind of nice to watch Mike uh, Mike develop on that, and I'm I'm trying to encourage him to uh, continue on. You know, he was talking about starting a blog on on um, on Black history, uh, especially in Chicago, and I think there's there'd be an interest in that. And uh, he's he's really knowledgeable. He's very very knowledgeable on on policy, as you'll see when we talk about what policy was or numbers, uh, what what the numbers record was on that sort of thing. Yeah, well, and that's important. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to find out and I, I that's good you know might keep on going don't, don't and don't let anybody discourage you just keep moving forward and uh do what you know is is right and do it well no, thanks. yeah and just thanks. keep going um now let's talk about teddy Rowe. uh who wants to tell me who teddy Rowe was exactly I could start off uh, a little bit, and Mike could, Mike could pick up. Uh, very interesting mm-hmm. guy, born at the turn of the 20th century, and uh, in uh, Louisiana, uh, rural Louisiana, uh, you know, which was uh, very segregated at the time. And um, and uh, he moved to um, uh, he moved around. He moved to Arkansas, and uh, eventually moved to Detroit, um, looking for work. And which was very common at the time. There was a lot of um, uh, uh, African Americans from the South moving north. You know, my, there's several migrations that took place, uh, looking for constantly looking for work. And depending on what part of the country they were from, either settled you know in one of the big cities like Detroit, New York, or Chicago. And um, a lot of a lot of people from Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, Alabama, and that area ended up in in uh, Chicago. So he eventually uh, uh, went there. And uh, he developed uh, uh, a craft, uh, a tailor. He became a tailor. And uh, when he eventually arrived in Chicago um, in search of employment, he ended up with uh, an interesting character named Ed Jones, who was one of the most uh, uh, important uh, uh, historical figures in early uh, 20th century uh, uh, Chicago African-American history. And, Mike, you want to pick up from there? Yeah, and I guess I'll pick up. Hello. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'll pick up here. And like I said, Ted Rowe. You know, I say after he went to work for Ed Jones. You know, Jones had worked for the tailor business, you know, into the numbers business, and pretty much became the biggest policy or numbers operator on the South Side of Chicago. And then Rowe became his. And as the um. You know, and, and, and during this time, it was pretty much strictly an African American operation. So this was before the outfit or the mafia had heard about the operation or really knew much about it. They had often heard of it, but no one, you know, really took it seriously. They, some people called it nigger pool. I remember one of the mayors of Chicago said, you know, my power, you know, my police force has better things to do than try to break up some crap game. Cause no one really thought, you know, African Americans could put, it, uh, you know, put anything that was really worthwhile together, so it was kind of really relatively ignored, you know, outside of the African American community, but as, you know, as the uh, pro- prohibition era ended, which was the main money maker for the mafia, they looked for, uh, you know, other ventures, and, you know, you know, Ed Jones again, and he was locked up in Terre Haute, Indiana, federal prison the same time as Sam Giacano was, and for whatever reason, the two of them, I guess, became acquaintances. I wouldn't say friends, and he told Giancana, you know, and his, his people speculate why he did this. Some say he wanted to spread policy outside of the African American community, but he told Sam Giancana everything about the numbers business, and they agreed to kind of work together, but this was um, to Ed Jones' downfall. I want to jump too far ahead of myself. Right on, on that, and, and Jan, Sam Giacana, uh, we know who Sam Giacana is. He eventually became, you know, Godfather of the outfit, and uh, he was uh, implicated in, you know, assassination of JFK and all that. And uh, he was just, um, he wasn't really a, a major player at this time in, in, in the late 1930s, early 1940s when he uh, met met, uh, met up with uh, Ed Rowe. But he was very ambitious, uh, very ambitious, and uh, he was a nasty individual, very nasty, but very. But very shrewd. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people questioned his intelligence. You know, whether he was smart or not. But I thought he had. I thought he had. Uh, I think he has the cunning to be a really top-notch criminal. And he eventually, you know, proved that proved that to be. And as far as uh, 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 Ed Jones, uh, I think he tried to. Ing- he, you know, he saw this this white guy that had 
a, a little bit of power being uh, associated with the mafia, and I think he tried to ingratiate himself with him, you know, and that's why he was so talkative. But, man, did he talk. You know, he, he blabbed everything, and uh, it was like an education for Giacana. He sat in this, um, in this prison listening to this, and he couldn't really believe it. He never really believed it, you know. He wanted to believe it because he saw an opportunity for himself as a gangster to, to move up in the outfit, this new stream of money and all that. And he didn't really believe it until, until he got out of prison, and Ed Jones got out of prison, and uh, he was able to see how jo- Ed Jones lived. I mean, Ed Jones lived like a king. And maybe uh, 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 Mike can talk about, you know, his lavish lifestyle on uh, that, um, that uh, Mike Rowe, that um, Ed Jones le- uh, led. Right. I said, Ed Jones, you know, he had um, not only top real estate in Chicago, he owned a big Benjamin Franklin store, he had property in Mexico. You know, he always, he was known as the man who never wore the same suit more than, you know, never wore the same suit twice. He and, you know, he had like a thousand people working for him. And he and Kyle's brother talked about this in his book. He was saying how he and Kyle, he and Kyle was so impressed by Ed Jones. He said, I just never knew the shine, which, well, you know, just the slang, a, a, a derogatory term from African American. He said, I never knew the shine where this model can put something like this together. Cause, you know, they were making thousands and thousands of dollars a day you know, off for operation that people just use nickel dimes and pennies to play off them. So, like, Ed Jones, like I said, he was like the real, you know, like how you would look at a mafia movie and see a godfather. That's how Ed Jones lived, like a real godfather or a king, hence the term policy king. Right. Uh, uh, Mike, maybe you should uh, talk a little bit about what we mean by policy, because there's a lot of confusion between numbers and... Yeah, oh, yeah. definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Now, you do such a great Running job... Numbers. Right, you, you do such a good okay. job in, in breaking it down like that. Why don't you go ahead and explain it? Oh, sure thing. I'd be very happy to. Okay, well, you often hear two terms, policy, and you often hear the term numbers. Now, oftentimes, now there, initially there were two separate things. Policy was played more so in the West, like the North, you know, the Midwest, like Chicago, Indiana, places like that. And it was played, you know, similar to the way the state lottery is. You could play for back then, you could play for a little as a penny or as much as to, or however much you wanted to play. And the number was drawn out of a wheel, you know. They would draw ten numbers, and you had to, you know, you should try to win three of them. Now, numbers was played mostly on the East Coast, like in New York and places like that. And the way they got their winning number, they used the, the last three digits of the clearinghouse stock exchange totals. And over time, as people migrated, you know, people, People from Chicago will go out, establish, you know, business in different areas of the state. People from New York will come out where, you know, like to Chicago. They, they, the games eventually became synonymous with one another where you can go to a policy station and play policy or you can play numbers. And then the terms just kind of became interchangeable. Like if you watch the old movie, you will hear people within the same sentence. You know, numbers runner, policy wheel, they became interchangeable, but initially there were two separate games. And Casper Holstein is credited with, um, he was a migrant from the Caribbean. He's credited with starting numbers, and policy Sam Young from New Orleans is credited with stars and policy in about 1885 in Chicago. It's really interesting. You you mentioned Casper Holstein, who, which I wrote about in my book, Gangsters of Harlem. Uh, he, like like uh, like Mike said, he was from the from the Caribbean, but uh, uh, he was an example of how important policy was to the African American community in times of segregation and racism, uh, because uh, he was a major employer in his community. And that's what people don't understand is that policy had a, had a tremendous beneficial uh, uh, impact on the African American community by creating business. And hiring people, and because uh, you know they needed a number of runners, they needed people to operate the policy wheels. Uh, they needed, right, needed uh, people to collect the numbers. You needed people to right. keep and account of the money. So it's like pretty much any well-established think of Bank of America or you know, any major bank and how many employees they had. That's pretty similar to how a policy station would, you know, and it was di- different. You know, it, there were like several, there were 12 major policy operators in Chicago at the time, and they all had their own policy station. So just imagine how many people that kept employed. Right. right. And, and the now, interesting uh, thing. 
at me. this point, though, at, at this point in the story, though, what was their relationship with local law enforcement? Okay, very interesting question. Okay, now, you got to, it was similar to how, I mean, policy was generally viewed as a harmless vice by most people. You know, because, like, everybody played in, it was played out, and it was like an open secret. You can go anywhere, the barber shop, the grocery store, you can see advertisements for, you know, each mm-hmm. policy drawing. They have a daily morning drawing, they have a midday drawing, the evening drawing. I said, similar to the, the way the lottery is today. And it was just really open. You had people who were, when well, I talked to people who lived in the era, they would lament about how the policy man would come to the house and, you know, collect everybody's numbers. So it was an open secret. I mean, law enforcement did crack down at times, but some people viewed it as, you know, something bad and stuff like that. But most people didn't. And then the policy kings, they were very well politically connected. So they were often able to avoid prosecution, you know, like, you know, by paying graft or bribes. And in a city like Chicago, you know, which is notorious, synonymous with corruption, you know, so they kind of worked hand in hand. Right. And also, you know, they were, uh, the, the policy kings were powerful individuals politically in the community. You know, they could help get out the black vote and all that. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, when the time came and get black support for, 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 uh, for, uh, for policies that, uh, that the white establishment were passing. And of course they paid them graft. I mean, everybody was, was on the take in those days, you know, uh, in Chicago. It was a very corrupt, uh, city. And it, and uh, you know the Capone the Capone mob you know Capone started the outfit uh, it was not the only uh, 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 group that was taking advantage of the corruption in the city too the policy kings were doing it as well. How much money are we talking? Like, uh, what kind of money do you make by uh, the policy? Millions. It was a multi-million dollar operation. I mean, you had wheels, and not even some of the major wheels were taking in like ten thousand dollars a day. And it's not just in Chicago. When I did, when I would research, now I would always come across the articles, police smash, $7,000 a day policy wheel, you know, $10,000 a day policy wheel shut down in New York. I mean, and it's amazing, but like I said, people were just playing with nickels, pennies, and dimes, but like I said, that money adds up. So it was, it was multi-million dollar operation, like I said, not just Ed Jones, but all of those big major policy operators, you know, own vast, lands of real estate. I mean, they own several, you know, were own multiple legitimate businesses. So it was just really a money-making operation. That's why the, once the mob found out about it, that's why they were just so hungry to take it over. Right. And, and of course, it was technically uh, illegal, so it was hard to, to get exact figures of, um, of how much money was being made. But all you had to do is look at how these policy kings lived. I mean, they lived like, like kings, as we described. And of course, uh, Giacana, when he saw how oh, Ed Jones, you uh, lived, you know, this, this, this uh, black guy who he thought was really nothing. Uh, you know, he really realized, you know, how much money was being made in that. And even when Jones was kidnapped, and, and we can talk a little bit about that, because that that's interesting. Yeah, that yeah that's interesting. Up. But uh, he, uh, it was a $100,000 ransom, and they paid it with no problems. And this mm-hmm. is, you know, in, in mm-hmm. the 1940s. So uh, you know, they had a, a tremendous amounts of money, and he had money in... Um, in, in uh, Mexico, he had property in Mexico. He was a he was a landowner in Mexico, and he went there regularly. In fact, that's where Ed Jones went after uh, retiring from the business after he was kidnapped. He was so f- uh, f- uh, frightened by what happened, he just he, he checked out. He just said, the "Heck with this, I'm leaving," and he went to Mexico. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like me now. Do you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, so why? Who kidnapped him, and, and what was the deal with that? Like, who was behind that? Well, Sam Giancana was behind the kidnapping. Uh, they got to they kicked that morning evening, and they you know they called Roe, his top lieutenant, and told him, you know, there was two hundred fifty dollar ransom. And you know, Roe told him it's not that much money on South Side of Chicago. You no know, more so the star tactic. But then he, you know, Jim, he spoke with Jones, and Jones told him to pay the ransom. And I see a lot of people believe that once the outfit saw how fast he can come up with the two hundred fifty thousand dollar ransom, they knew. This business is lucrative as people say, so we gotta get in on it. And you know, Jones where well, after the kidnapping, you know, Jones was pretty much exiled, you know, so you can you can, you can walk away with your life and you can stay in Chicago and we'll kill you pretty much. So he beat it to Mexico. And of course that's where Teddy Rose saw an opportunity. You know, they expected the whole policy racket to fold, but Teddy Rose stepped in and said, uh, being an ambitious uh 
uh, quote businessman himself and decided to step in and he wasn't he wasn't going anywhere and that's where the problem started. But uh, one of the uh, one thing I should point out is that uh, you know unlike the outfit uh, and and organized crime in Chicago with 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 the white mob and all that, uh, there was really no violence involved in this in this business. I mean, really, I mean, you know, they had a council which operated like you know the the famous council in New York City that uh, Luciano set up. Uh, between all the policy, and there was really no violence until the white mob got in to the uh, into the the business after the kidnapping of Jones. Is that right, Mike? Uh, exactly. And you know, Chuck Giancana. Another thing that Chuck Sam Giancana's brother Chuck talk about in Double Cross. You know, he laments that you know a lot of times the Posse Kings would have their meetings, and you know, the Boogie Woogie Club. You know, a club that was owned by Giancana. He said sometimes he the meetings would get so heated, he had to pull his gun, and you know escort people out, but it was never violent. He said with his brother, it was just straight out murder. You know, people didn't do what you're supposed to do, you get killed. Arguments with disagreements led to murder, but he, but he said it wasn't like that with the policy kings. Because see, even though it was an illegal business, most of these guys were businessmen. You know what I mean? That's why some people call them gangsters, but it's more correct term. They just were well, basically racketeers, maybe, because they they were in the policy business largely because they couldn't get, you know, real game for employment anywhere else. You know, because you got to keep in, you know, keep in mind the context of when all this was occurring. This was, you know, during segregation, you know, you know, it was in the South. Chicago was still a very segregated city. So, so you couldn't just go downtown and work for, say, a company like Merrill Lynch or whatever the major companies of that time were. So these guys, a lot of them were college educated and they just had to take their accounting skills and stuff like that they learned in college and apply it to the policy business because that was one of the few avenues that were open to them. So they just really weren't all about that violence and stuff like that. Like you had 12 big policy operators, what's called the Big 12 Syndicate. There was never any violence between them or, uh, you know, taking over trying to take over each other's wheels. They recognize that, hey, it's plenty to go around. You know, everybody, just keep it to respectable business. And that's how it was until the outfit muscled in. And, and, the, and the problem was, was that because they weren't really violent by nature, they were more businessmen than, than gangsters and all that, when the outfit moved in with their violent approach to uh, doing uh, uh, criminal business, uh, they were at a big disadvantage, you know, because they didn't know how to react. Uh, you know, because they weren't violent. I mean, they, they, you know, if you, if you ticked them off, they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna try to kill you. They tried to negotiate with you. And, uh, you didn't do mm-hmm. that with Giacana. Giacana was a cold-blooded killer, uh, that wore, that wore a business suit. And, uh, so they were at a disadvantage. And, uh, this happened the same thing in New York with, uh, with Dutch Schultz, uh, where, uh, Dutch Schultz was able to pick off the, the policy kings one by one. And the same thing happened. In Chicago, is that when the mob moved in, they were able to pick them off one by one, uh, and um, and uh, eventually take over the business. But before they were able to, uh, to 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 attempt to take over the business, they had to deal with one man, and that was Teddy Roll, the, the Robin Hood of the Hood. Yeah, like I said, Teddy Roll. No, he has been described and been described as the baddest black man that ever hit the South Side of Chicago. And so, when you think about yeah, they really keep this in context. And this was like in the late 50s, late 40s, early 50s. So this was before the Civil Rights Movement, before the Black Power Movement or any of that type of stuff. It was also during the heyday of the mob. And when I say the mob, it's like the same sect of the mob that you know, was rumored to have killed President Kennedy, that was rumored to have been involved in the Bay of Pigs and all that. So this one guy who, like I said, didn't come from a gang, you know, wasn't a gangster, Stand up to this type of mob during that time, it's just unheard of. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's just unbelievable that he had this type of guts to do something like that. Right. And, uh, that was part of his, you know, the expression where the, somebody acts really crazy and everybody's afraid of him because they don't know what he's going to do. And they didn't know what to do with Teddy Rowe because, you know, Teddy Rowe even had a confrontation with Sam Giacana where Sam Giacana uh, was in a, in a, um, uh, nightclub called the Boogie Woogie, <laughs> nice name, uh, and uh, he's actually he actually pushed him, and, and he was with a couple of his gangsters, and you would think that something would happen to Teddy Rowe, nothing happened, and uh, this happened several times. He just wouldn't go away, but the uh, the outfit just couldn't figure out what to do with them because they never had a uh, you know uh, an adversary like him uh, before. 
And, and what do you attribute that to? The, the, do you think that they feared his power, or do you think that they more feared the power of the community because of their respect and their love for him and what he was bringing to the community? Before Mike, yes. uh, I'll, I'll just say, that's a good question, and I never really, in my research, I never really was able to figure out why. The only thing I, 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 um, I, 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 could, I could figure was that you know, he was a, a, an African-American who didn't act like an African-American at the time. He was not afraid of white organized crime. And, uh, and so anything he did was perplexing to them. They didn't know how to react to him. And, um, uh, Mike, you want to add to that? Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question. Because I said, um, you know, again, we quote Chuck, Chuck Yen kind of, you know, he often talked about how Sam was, was talking about, how, like, he said Sam has like a, just a, some sort of a, but in respect for Rogue, because no one's ever stood up to him like that before. And I said, Rogue, he employed a small army of bodyguards, which were police, no, all duty police officers. And it was just, I think it was just a, more so of a thing that he caught the mob. You know, I guess you know how sometimes they say, if you're a hunter, you know, if the lion turns on a hunter, now the hunter is being hunted, they don't know exactly what to do in that situation. I think it was kind of like that. I was like, wow, he this guy. Because, you know, in all the conversation between Roe and the mob, you know, it even resulted in the death of Jim Collins' best friend, fell against the fat Lena Caifano, where Roe, well, it was either Roe or his bodyguard, you know, killed fat Lenny when it was attempted to kidnap Roe the same way he did Jones. But this time, the mob was going to kidnap him for the ransom and kill him after the ransom was paid, but the tables got turned on them. So they just didn't really know what to do. And they might have, you know, feared community reaction because Roe was, you know, really was well loved in the community. You know, so just one of those things that's open to speculation. But that was, you know, a good right. question to ponder. Uh, Fat Lenny Cafano was, uh, was um, uh, a soldier in the uh, outfit. And, and, uh, and Roe and Ro, uh, really, Teddy really stepped over the line when uh, he, he killed him. He, he killed, so, he had, so the mob really had to act. Of course, there's there's also you know uh, it's, it's kind of hazy, but the question of uh, of uh, Teddy Rose's health too, and maybe Mike can explain about that. Uh, yeah, now after Rose was killed, um, you know his wife you know just did an interview with Time Magazine, and she said that you know Rose had been to the doctor weeks before and had only been given like a couple of months to live. And people, you know, when I like I said I do my research, people say that you know after that diagnosis. So he sent his bodyguards home and just kind of, you know, waited for it to happen. Now, some people dispute that, but it is kind of because that night, except September 4th, there were no bodyguards present, and he was murdered like about 10 o'clock at night after he had went to his car to retrieve something. So that's kind of like, you know, why, if you know the mob is at you, why are you going out at night? No bodyguards. So it's, it's a plausible story, you know, but, you know, like most killings, there's several interpretations of what really happened, and, and you know, no one's really going. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, but, but, but Mike, course, that's. It. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just, I was just going to add, and of course, this added to the legend, you know, and 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 Mike could talk about his reputation today in the black community. He's still, you see, he's a living legend in the black community because of uh, of, of how he handled the the outfit. Mm hmm. Well, let's let's stay on his health for for just a moment. You know, as you were speaking, Mike, I can picture this in my head, and it makes absolute sense. I mean, why not? You know, why not go out with a bang rather than a, a sick whimper in your bed? If I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory and honor. You know, I'm going to show yeah. these S SOBs. You know, we're just as good as them. We're just as organized. You know, we can. You know, we we can take you over should we choose. You know, uh, exactly. you know, can't, you know, uh, I, I don't say this disparagingly, but, but having cancer or a terminal disease sometimes gives you a case of the brass cojones, right. you know, mm -hmm. you know, what have I got to lose? What, what's the worst you have to offer? We, we really, really don't know why uh, on that. I mean, he could have just realized that the fight was up. That's another possible reason, you know, where he just said the fight was up and I, I'm just going to go out and, uh, you know, uh, check out and he, he got rid of his bodyguards and all that so we really don't know what what really happened because uh, there's a lot of uh, good explanations for for what but it doesn't uh, diminish uh, teddy rose courage and uh his uh unbelievable story you know in, in terms of uh, how he how he dealt with the the outfit which is uh, you know, 
the time, probably the most powerful criminal organization in America. Mm-hmm. So now, maybe explain now, what's, what was the effect of Roe on, on not only the community, but Chicago, even the states? And why was he called Robin Hood? Well, see, so he was called the Robin Hood because he's similar like Robin Hood, you know, he was, he gave to the poor and it wasn't, and it was genuine. It wasn't like something for publicity or trying to make himself look good like a lot of gangsters tried to do, stab a soup kitchen and stuff and say, hey, I'm not a big guy. You know, it was legitimate. You know, he put people, and not just him, a lot of the possibilities, they gave scholarships to people, you know, trying to go to college. You know, people who couldn't pay their rent, they were knowing sometimes, you know, people pay, pay people's rent. Because they understood that, hey, listen, we're segregated, you know, we're at the bottom of society. They knew, look, we're making money off the community, so we're going to give money back to the community. And that, that was just like a theme throughout policy, whether it was in Chicago, whether it was in New York. I remember watching the program over they had Ruby D on, and she was saying, I talked about how exciting Harlem was before the white gangsters took over, and she was saying there was always this house in the corner that you needed anything you could go to. You know, if you needed aid, you just needed, you know, just a few dollars to help you buy until you got paid. There was always this house you can go to, and that was a similar with Roe, you know, where, like I said, he took on the, you know, the, the uh, invading gangsters, you know, he gave back to his community, and people looked up to him for that. Because when he at his funeral, you know, an estimated twenty thousand people showed up for his funeral. And after his death, you know, people there's one particular rep, the Reverend Cobb. He wasn't necessarily a fan of policy, but he did organize a lot of people in the community to stay away from the white wheels. You know, you wheels that was known to be associated with the outfit, they were boycotted. And I'm not sure how long that lasted, but that was just that did occur after his death. That's just how beloved he was in the community. Right. Uh, I think uh, Teddy Roll never forgot, never forgot where he came from. He came from very humble mm-hmm. beginnings, and uh, and uh, he did a lot of things uh, uh, with that in mind. You know, because you know, you look at Al Capone. Al Capone's famous for the soup kitchens uh, that he set up during the Depression in Chicago. And it was it was all show. And, uh, you know, uh, other gangsters, you know, have done the same thing. Uh, and mainly it's just part of their PR effort to try to stay in good with the community. But I think it was genuine on, um, on Teddy Rose's part. There were stories that, uh, you know, never, they never made, you know, news, like, you know, helping, you know, somebody, for example, there's a famous story where a, a, a elderly woman, uh, was not paid the money she made that she won on, on the policy wheel. And, uh, he, he would, he went to her, he went to the guy. The, the policy guy that was supposed to pay her and, and said, look, you're going to pay this woman her money <laughs> or it's, it's not going to be a good situation for you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because cause that just defeats faith in the whole system and that could cost you business. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, But uh, but he, he just one of those remarkable characters that not many people know about that, uh, that, that uh, uh, pop up in organized crime. You know, and I, I've, I've done... and. I've done, you know, Frank Matthews, for example, the guy that disappeared, a uh, famous uh, gangster. Ike Atkinson is another one. But this guy, uh, Teddy Rowe, ranks right up there with, with, uh, with, with those characters in terms of his story and in terms of, uh, of uh, his character. What kind, what kind of personal life did he have being so involved with this kind of a lifestyle? Uh, did this affect his personal life? Was he able to get married, have kids, uh, do, do the uh, normal things like that, or... Uh, maybe explain a little bit about that. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, that's interesting. There's not a lot, unfortunately, there's not a lot known about uh, about his personal life. He was married to Carrie Gibbons. Uh, that was his wife. And interestingly enough, interesting story about her. After Ted's death, she took up with another policy king, uh, Jim Jim Knight, I believe it was. And they're actually, and she's buried with him, as opposed to be buried. Next to Roe, I mean, all of them are buried in Lincoln Cemetery in Blue Island, but she took up with him after her death, after Ted's death. You know, as far as, you know, other things about his personal life, I mean, he lived in a nice home on 52nd and Michigan, you know, right where he was, right where he was murdered at. And as far as children, I don't know if he had any children. I mean, I was able to check down some descendants of Roe, and they've never mentioned any direct children of him, like, but, 
uh, that's as far as I know. And like I said, he was, um, other things, I mean, he did, you know, he was known to frequent the club circuit, you know, go to crap games that were big on the south side of Chicago. So he did most of the regular stuff, but it's just not like a lot of information around, unfortunately, you know, that paints that paint a more broad picture of his life, though. And that was right. one of the things that prompted me to get into, to get into this research. I was like, wow, I can go to the library or do an internet search and have more information than I ever wanted to know about Capone, about Gene Connor, you know, about it, Luciano. But these guys, I mean, it's like I have to dig through volumes of old magazines and just that's right, and I've done I've done research on several uh, black gangsters, and uh, that's that's the problem. It's trying to find you know, this personal information. You know, it's buried in history. There isn't a record of it, and of course, being gangsters too, that's another you know uh, uh, impediment right. to, uh, to doing research because you know gangsters don't keep records uh, on that. So uh, you know, and, uh, unless, unless there's a trial or something, uh, you know, uh, if you have a trial, then you could you could uh, dig into the trial because there's a lot of witnesses and all that sort of stuff so a lot of details come out but if you don't have that it's very difficult to try to piece together uh, the background of uh, a lot of these characters and teddy rose and uh, right that. and that was one of the things that made me so appreciative of ron because i was like you know a lot of the you know of course you know back in those days of segregated so a lot of the mainstream media the white press or media establishments weren't going to keep a lot of you know books or anything about african-americans but I was always so upset that none of the African Americans did it themselves. So that's why I came about coming across Ron writing all these books. I'm like, wow, he's this white guy writing all these books about stuff that, you know, that people like, you know, generations later like me want to know about. You know, he's writing about it where people who lived through this era never bothered to write about it. So that was like one of the other things that really prompted me to call him and just say, hey, man, thanks for writing this type of stuff. You don't know how much this type of stuff means to people of my generation because now I'm like 50 years after Roe and so I talk to the old people and stuff like that who lived through the era of the few that I left and they like I said speak with such admiration about him but I'm like why did anybody never bother to write this stuff down you know what I mean so it was kind of so my research is just really frustrating because it was just so hard to do yeah and, and well, you see the, well, well, why it's so important when you see the impact of policy you know, on the on the African American community, and there hasn't been much written about that. It really hasn't. There's been a, a couple of books, but they, they're not really. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, really cover the story of, of how policy historically has impacted on African American history, and it's been a really big, big, um, uh, big impact. Well, it's not so unusual though not to write it down because that could be seen as evidence for the police in a RICO case. Yeah. But through their admiration, though, is how they kept his legend alive is through oral traditions. Yeah. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And uh, he's gonna he's gonna live on. Yeah. And we did our little part to keep the story alive, but uh, uh, <laughs> it, you know it, it's an important part of the the African American history in, in Chicago. And, and Mike, you're in Chicago now, aren't you? Yes. How, how do you think that um, that has influenced life today in Chicago? Well, you know, it influenced it on, in a number of ways. I mean, when they, but some of it's been negative. I mean, when the policy was finally, well, first of all, when the mob kind of muscled in, it took away a lot of jobs because, like I said, they would cut the salaries, you know, where people were making as far as like when when the African American owner owned his wheel, you know, they would make tens of tens tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars. But when the mob moved in, they were regulated to make the salaries most of them. And like I said they she was trying to cut costs, they would lay off workers and stuff like that. And even some places led to people staying in boycotts because they're like, you know, you're cutting workers you know, people depend on this. And then when the final death nail to the policy business, when the real crooks came and took over, which was the state in 1974, the state lottery, <laughs> that just was the deathbed. I mean, you thought the mob was crooks, you know, the Illinois lottery, oh my God. That you, you, had to, you had to pay for a dollar, and if the money's supposed to go to education, but you go through any school in the African American community, you see it, the money's not evenly di distributed, so... <laughs> so that left a big vacuum. I mean, because, like I said, the policy kings, whereas in mainstream society in that era, you can go to the bank for a loan. 
an African American not at the same time couldn't go to a bank for a loan, so they had to go to a policy king to start a business or to start whatever venture they wanted to start a newspaper or anything like that. You know, you know, you you know, you when I was doing my research, almost any established well, I won't say almost any, but a good majority of any type of established thing in the African American community, there was a policy king at the end of that line. I mean Joe Lewis boxer Joe Lewis's manager, the famous boxer his manager was a big time policy king. He was the owner of a Negro League baseball team. I mean, just a lot of the insurance companies, when they, like the, some of the first African American insurance companies, you know, they got their financing from policy guys. So when that, so when that pipe, so it was like the pipeline to the black community, so when that pipeline was plugged up, it's, you know, it just, it just left a big vacuum in which kind of street games kind of stepped up and filled that vacuum, which has been a major detriment no, on the community. Right. Yeah, so that's it, great. It, it, what Mike is saying is ending had a deleterious <laughs> effect on the, black, on the uh, black community in Chicago. Yeah. As elsewhere, as Pittsburgh, uh, New York, some of the other big Philadelphia, Philadelphia, New York, all over. Yeah. And, and Chicago now is known as quite a, uh, a shooting and uh, violent city, and it has been for a few years now. Um, do you attribute a lot of the gangster life to it, like the uh, mobs? Well, the gangs, so, um, I'll, I'll just say before you stop, he knows more about this, but the gangs are a very important part of the story. Right. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, because, like, um, oh, go ahead. Well, uh, l- let me add this in be- before you answer. Um, I-, I agree to an extent, but it appears to me in-, in my research and listening to you guys talk that the gangs of old had a certain respect for each other and they had respect within their community. Respect, not fear. You know, there's, there's two types of morale. There's positive morale and there's negative morale. You can get people to do what you want, either one of those ways. But with with Mr. Rowe, it seemed like he had the respect and he had the love of the people. Now they're, it's the damned okay corral. You know, let's just shoot, you know. Yeah. You know, that's pretty much a good estimation of it. You say those, you say those guys really didn't, in the past business, violence was, you know, like a last resort and often, you know, often really resorted to. Whereas today, I've said it's just out and out gangsterism, you know, people getting shot, you know, that's how they forget on their, on their respect by the more, the bigger shooter you know as, the more respect you get. Right. And, um, you know, and just rewinding back a little bit, I do want to add, like around 19, you know, like right before the state line was established, you know, there's the emergence of the street gangs began to emerge in Chicago in the early 60s, you know, throughout the 70s. They did begin to take back some of what the mob took out of the black community. For example, Chicago Tribune did an article in 1971 called Doing a Number on the Mob, where they talk about the mob having to pay big slums, slums of cash for to these street gangs to stop robbing their policy establishments. Because, you know, during this era, you know, the civil rights movement and the black power movement was starting to usher in. And even, and even further down the gang street gangs, they're like, you know, why are we taking all the risk? And this is our neighborhood. Why are we letting these white guys just push us around? So they began, like I said, robbing number establishments. And then with the emergence of drugs, that really emboldened these street gangs to the point that that's when the mob began to get really pushed out of South South Chicago. And there's this one well documented story about a particular black gangster named Jeff Ford. Been the leader of the Black Peace Donation, and you know he had, you know, as he began to gain power, he had started, you know, selling drugs. And of course, in Chicago, any type of illegal operation, you're supposed to pay up the chain, which is to the outfit. You know, you're supposed to pay a street tax, and they had warned Jeff for it. You know, you're supposed to pay us, but he kept ignoring the warnings. And finally, he agreed to come to a sit down with them. And after the sit down, two members of the mob were found dead. And later the next day, the restaurant where the sit down took place was burnt to the ground, and a message was sent to the outfit, get a South Shire Chicago and stay out. And I said, by this time, the Black T Stones number, uh, conservatively about 5,000 members, and the outfit at best had three to 400 members, which were middle aged old guys. 
so they had no real choice but to, you know, take a step back, you know. But but not to... Drugs was the game, drugs was the game changer. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, it made, it made the, uh, the gangs really powerful and, and they're also violent because of the money involved and there's so many players in the communities, you know. And it was a different generation. I mean, these, uh, like, like uh, Mike said, you know, the Black Power movement was big. Uh, uh, they weren't going to take any crap from, uh, from the, the, the white mob like uh, earlier generations of um, policy kings did, you know, with, with the white mob. Mm-hmm. And it was just a whole new different era, and uh, they had more power. It was a numbers game, like, like Mike said, you know, 5,000, 400 or so. And uh, the, the white mob uh, did the, the discretion of the better part of valor and decided to, uh, you know, back off. Hmm. Wow. What a great, great story. Excellent book. Uh, recommend it. We have it posted on our website. And it is a, a Kindle book only. And right. At this point, right. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna, to gonna come up with other uh, uh, venues. Yeah, it's always good. Uh, right. The name of the book, Robin Hood of the Hood, The Life and Times of Teddy Rowe, Policy King. And our guests have been the authors. We had Michael Rowe and Ron Chepsik. Thank you very much for being on the and show. May I add one thing? Oh, uh, you're you. going to be on my show. You're going to be on my show on uh, September 27th. Yes. Yes, uh, on Crime Beat. Uh, so <laughs> please tune in. Uh, we'll have Alan uh, talk about one of his great books. And uh, we, we hope you can tune in. To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.